Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Noman live stream. I'm your host, Adam Hartel. And uh, hey, if you just saw the reel we showed uh, at the intro, that is the Noman campus. If you're new to Noman, we are a 3D art school located in Hollywood, California. And uh, we are training artists for careers in visual effects, games, and animation. Uh, and we just announced, in fact, that we uh, will be reopening campus in the fall. So we're all very excited about that. Um, but with regards to today's stream, I'm really excited uh, for the guest that we have, Tony Leonard. Uh, we're going to be uh, going off world today uh, to Ganymede. And uh, Tony's been doing some amazing world building uh, in 3D. And he's going to kind of give us a tour of his project. But before we do that, um, I just want to uh, mention that if you are in need of closed captioning, uh, that is available on our Facebook live feed. So if you need closed captioning, just head over there. And um, my colleague in the chat, who's moderating the chat today, will um, give you a, a link uh, as to how to get there. And uh, and you know, a good thing to know as well is you know these Friday morning streams have been a lot of fun because we've been taking some time to talk to artists specifically about what they're doing in the world that that no one is a part of. But also, we've been keeping in mind, you know, any of you who are watching who uh, maybe are new to 3D or maybe you're even new to digital art. Maybe you're doing a lot of traditional drawing and painting and you're really curious about, uh, you know, digital art, digital 3D and how artists are making some of this amazing and compelling stuff. And so that's really why we've been doing these streams. And I want you to know that whether this is totally new to you or whether you're a veteran and, and, and you're just super interested because this is what you do, please feel free to type your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we're gonna do our best to get to your questions, um, but even if you've got a, a simple question uh, or you feel like a beginner, please feel free to ask that. We'd love to take some time to, to address anything that, that you wanna talk about. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our guest, uh, Tony Leonard, uh, who is a 2D and 3D concept artist. So Tony's a, three, a freelance 2D, 3D concept, concept artist and illustrator. He's worked in graphic design for nearly 20 years, including work at Game Republic in uh, Nagoya Studio, Japan, where he contributed to Knight's Contract. He's also worked at Heavy Metal Magazine as a comics and graphic novel uh, illustrator. Recently, he has embarked on the development of storytelling environments using Unreal Engine 4 and virtual production. Um, uh, he's using these techniques to produce short films. And this combines multiple disciplines between ZBrush, Blender, Unreal Engine 4, Megascans, Substance Painter, and so much more. Uh, so we're going to get into that today. And I'd just like to say, Tony, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hi. How are you? Thank you for having me. Cheers. Yeah. How are you doing, sir? Fairly well. It's a yeah. nice day out in beautiful Southern California. You know, it's going good. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't want to I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but you're going to be taking us to Ganymede today, and we're, we'll find out soon what that means. Yes. And uh, you know, but uh, you know, just if you've ever wanted to go off world, this is your chance, guys. Uh, and Tony's <laughs> going to show us around. Um, but before we do that, um, I was wondering if we could just take a few minutes off the top to just hear a little bit about your story um, and your journey into art, because you've done a lot of different things um, that that have taken yeah. you to a lot of different places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, when back in probably about the late 90s, uh, I got started um, in my career. Um, but yeah, even since, you know, I was age 21 or so, like, the, I think uh, I did small graphic jobs that led into, you know, you know, just base kind of stuff, like doing apparel work or silk screening, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And then that grew into doing comics because I had a, a serious um, interest in, in illustrating comics, you know, as a penciler and inker. Um, and then, you know, working with some smaller publishers and then probably peaking when I did some things, uh, I think, uh, for Penguin, as mm -hmm. well as, uh, wow, it's been so many years. Uh, I think I did some work for uh, Dark Horse you know, at a small piece that went into a, an anthology for The Escapist uh, and just kept going. and. That has taken me through a career where, you know, I left the States and resided in Japan and worked in graphic design there uh, as a regular nine to five type of job, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working in-house as a, as a designer, mostly web stuff. Um, but I, I've worked with also a lot, of, you know, before I left uh, with graphic design companies like Point Zero. I don't think that they're, they're much around, but, you know, big clients like they had Pioneer and a few other branding things that I was doing. And then much later, you know, as the early 2000s rolled around, started doing a little bit of comic work here and there um, while, while working in graphic design in Japan. And 
then remotely from there did some comics here uh, while I was living over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then as soon as I came home, uh, I started working freelance, doing a little bit of things like storyboarding, um, you know, just like idealization sketch work. Uh, so I, I, I do, you know, use a traditional, you know, hand method of actually sketching things out and drawing, you know, mm -hmm. that move to digital painting. Uh, and then as I moved into sculpting, I think I was maybe my wife and I were pregnant with my first son. Uh, I had a lot of time on my hands, you know, uh, and so I jumped into ZBrush and went headlong with that and have just been building on those experiences since as, a, you know, doing not only 2D, but, you know, using 3D to assist some of those 2D efforts mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, doing a lot of paint over work and stuff like that. And then it grew into more of a desire to maybe perhaps make, you know, some type of storytelling using motion. And I mm -hmm. think that was like probably about two years ago, you know, I was like, ah, you know, the epiphany of things with mocap data, Unreal, um, you know, the guys over at Quixel uh, did mm -hmm. the rebirth video, which was a huge inspiration. Oh yeah, amazing. And uh, more relevant to now, you know, you have, you know, guys like uh, Beeple, you know, mm -hmm. um, who've put work out and, you know, between the, the timing of a few different influences, I was like, you know, I would love to do, you know, some shorts and Unreal and dabble with it. And, but of course the learning curve there is jumping headlong into Unreal and, 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 you know, something that's totally different than my usual repertoire of things that I would use and kept going from there. And, and it's now progressed into sort of a storytelling venture where I want to do some mm -hmm. short films and be able to find a, a venue where that, you know, I, I could do shorts, you know, good enough to, to put up on the internet uh, and then maybe turn into some more of a, a higher production value. Yeah. No, extremely cool. And I think that's, that's, that's the, your story is the perfect setup for what you're about to show us because it's <laughs> going to be the culmination cheers. of literally all of those things. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. I'll, it, I'll it, just give like, them. Uh, it, I was just going to say, yeah. it's, it's much like uh, deciding that you want to do your own film, you know, and, and how do you go yeah. about that and what you use. Um, and it, it really starts to, challenge your cinematic mind as to composition, camera work, um, but so many, so much more because it, if you're doing a little bit of, uh, you know, model making uh, plus texturing, you know, the end line is that you need to deliver it somewhere where it will have the most, the most impact or, or look the best. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with that judgment, I just started building little small, um, using Unreal to, to basically build like a, a digital backlog, you know, like if you yeah. think of a backlog, you know, yeah, and I, I can't wait to see what you're doing in Unreal because um, something I've been fascinated with. And, um, you know, I think it's the, even in concept, which you, you work in concept, it's, it's so much of that has moved into 3D because at the end of the day, we're making images that are ultimately relating to a story. And it's usually right. going to be some sort of an animated story that has framing and that kind of stuff. So 3D just yeah. becomes this great cinematic tool uh, to set up right. your shots and everything. So. Yeah, why don't you take us in? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm gonna hand the mic over right. to you, and uh, I'll, I'll be here, kind of looking over your shoulder, uh, nerding you, out on what you're you. doing, and <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm gonna. <laughs> would you like me to roll one of the most recent clips that I did? Yeah, absolutely. Whatever you'd like to I start that, with. That might be a good start here. Let me. Sure, I, I'm gonna drop it in the tool there. Let me just right. dig it up. And this is going to be one of the one of the shorts that you've recently made. Yeah. Right? Um, okay, basically, cool. I don't know if you're showing my screen, but I, but I have Unreal up. But the playback would be better delivered if I if I go ahead and drop the video into the tool here. So I'm gonna. Oh, okay. Take it yeah, out. sure. We can we can wait for you to do that. No problem. Sorry, I had these cute things queued in VLC, but I I suppose it would be better heard and seen this way. So get to it. Real. And while Tony's setting that up for us, um, guys, I'll also let you know that, you know, uh, everything Tony's showing us, of course, is adjacent to, you know, everything that Nomen teaches as a school. So if you're, if you've got questions about Nomen, about our academic offerings, that kind of thing, 
uh, one of my colleagues who actually is one of the Noman advisors who they spend a lot of time uh, coaching artists and doing portfolio coaching before people apply to the school. You can feel free to ask any questions you've got uh, as well, and they'd be happy to help you out. Very cool. That, that is, was awesome. So now that you've seen that, um, probably the best way for me to explain some of the things is just to uh, give you guys kind of like a little fly through through the level. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, I'll, I'll take you through a tour of some of the other levels that I have that are, are soon coming to, to actually filming. So right now you caught me at a sort of transitional mode where I'm, I'm this, this level is pretty much uh, good to go for just filming, but uh, I still go in and make minor improvements and, and change things. So sometimes I'll, I'll try to do like recuts of things. Mm -hmm. And when I move down to the city floor, uh, where I'll show you, I have a different, everything's broken up into different stages, of course. Okay. So I, I just ask everybody to be patient while I open these things. But yeah, no uh, here, if I can show you my screen, I'm going to go full screen mode. And I'll kind of show you how the scene is set up. So using Unreal, um, I'm actually just flying around. It's a little, little tight on the mm -hmm. speed here. Let me get this up a little bit. Because you've like oh, literally that... made an entire world for this scene, right? Like yeah. There's, there's a lot going on in here. Yeah, so I'm actually trying a few things, but um, using the, the massive scale of uh, Unreal's uh, landscape, Mm -hmm. um, I'm using some of the sculpting tools inside of Unreal. Um, and funny enough, a lot a lot of the ranges and craters and things, I actually used some alphas from uh, Zebra Pixel Logics uh, downloads for, for like Oh alphas. yeah. So you and, just sculpted uh, those in ZBrush, just straight up? Yeah. Well, it's some of them are sculpted in ZBrush, and it's, some of them are used with the same alphas in Unreal on its Oh, landscape. OK, cool. OK. So, you can it's it's set really really big as far as like the world scale um and as you can see most of these they have a bit of a terrain on it which if you close in it's a little jaggy mm -hmm. but beyond those peaks when you put a texture on it or smooth it out it it starts to even out some of the, yep. the pixels and it looks really nice yeah uh so you know everything i'm going to be doing is mostly flying above it so i'm not actually rocking on the ground surface as of yet but mm -hmm. Uh, if you really go up to see how this is made, you'll see that there's an edge to the horizon, of course, and then there are a couple of things that are placed interstitially so that they intersect, and I can get a little bit of variation out of the terrain. Like, say, for example, you know, just a, a crater card, you know, and then that mm -hmm. card gets pushed back into the distance, and it covers some of the sort of, uh, I guess, horizontal quality of the the horizon so that it doesn't look like it's missing a gap or anything like that. Um, but yeah, just steady, slow construction of a lot of uh, different terrain elements. Um, mm -hmm. There are things that are here that are mixed in from Megascans and the wonderful guys over at Epic and Quixel, you know, where they had uh, Icelandic rocks um, mm, and yeah. those textures and, you know, assets have been brought over uh, and then altered. See, because a lot of them are really highly customizable where you can go into the material instance of uh, any of the materials that you get from them. Uh, and you can kind of tailor them to your project by, you know, changing the tint color of the rock or something like that. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, but one of the major 
points of interest in this map, I can scooch over here, is the flight of the shuttle. And um, I just want to give a, a, a small shout out. The 2049 spinner that I borrowed for this yeah. scene uh, was actually modeled by Pete Norris in the UK. Mm. And it's a, it's a guest mesh. And so between a few friends in the concept art community, uh, guys like uh, Edon Gorazui, or Gar I'm, I'm probably murdering his last name i apologize but i have some work from it on i have uh, a few pieces that actually are from uh, uh, the departed mike uh which are guest character meshes that at some point i hope to present but I, I need to work it out you know everything is fair with his folks but unfortunately you know <laughs> he passed away and and uh but I still have a few of his models to to put on film that we were working with, you know, before then. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also have a lot of other guys, you know, every once in a while, you know, hey, can you use this as a prop? And I'll guest mesh them in to the project. But mostly, uh, ninety eight percent of this has been built, you know, textured. You know, I've just the 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 pipeline of just uh, either modeling, uh, sculpting, texturing, as you said. Uh, using things like Mixer uh, and Substance Painter as well, um, and funneling everything into Unreal. So it, it, it becomes really a nice, fun process uh, to be able to put everything in frame and see how it looks and some, you know, yeah. go back and redo things so that it can oh, that, look better on camera. That spinner's yeah, beautiful but, uh, too. Yeah, it's it's quite film accurate. It has yeah. like a, an, an actual full-on interior here. I can camera's speed's a little high, but there we go. And uh, depending on the lighting, the, the emissives in this, the panel actually lights up and mm -hmm. actually has like a, a readout on it. Uh, those those same UV spots could, you know, you could put a card and animate things into or mm -hmm. the, the doors are separate. So you could actually put bones in it and actually have it move. So it's kind of it kind of cool to work with a, a, a nice detailed prop. Yeah. Uh, and then there is what I call the Sega Highway here, which is <laughs> a modular piece. Uh, it, that's that's actually a, a, an Easter egg. So, like, as you you and I were having conversations, a lot of times in this project, I'll hide some some little Easter mm -hmm. eggs, um, you know, that are relevant or a head nod to sci-fi uh, or another you know IP or story that I love in, in science fiction filming. And so, you know, every once in a while, there are little little things that or quirks that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I remember that, you know, and, and you would look around, but it's nested in the scenery somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and if These you could really it, it, just pause for us a second of that nice view you had of the highway there, just give us a pause sure. and give a chance for the renderer to kind of start to fill in some of the pixels. Cause this is so cinematic. I mean, you've got some great perspective atmosphere. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I think um, one of the things yeah, I love, yeah, if I can nerd yeah. out for just a second, one of the things I love about sure. working in a 3D environment like this is even as you were moving around and coming in close on the spinner, like you can just accidentally find amazing compositions just by moving your camera around. Like you oh, came yeah. in close to the spinner. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you know, what if we had a camera mounted on the side of the spinner and it flies in down into the, you know, so it's so exactly. inspiring uh, just to get in that world and mess around. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. and. Um, you, you actually touched upon something that's kind of like a, a really good um, habit of mine is when I'm building and composing scenes, I jump, jump all over the place, you know, thinking this is the camera, you know, my head mm -hmm. is my head is the camera looking into one view and I change the view and that depends on like the placement, even even if I'm just sort of popping and pushing assets around like, yeah, yeah, I want it over yeah. there. And it really speaks to like, you know, when I see uh, extras videos on Disney, and you know, you have somebody like mm -hmm. John Favreau, and he's talking about the amazing things of, you know, virtual production. About you know, I can do anything I want. It's like a magical toolbox where you can place things, and it doesn't take a production crew, you know, another week to you know make changes or anything like that. You know, because it's it's all virtual and it's all there and it's all real time in the environment, and you can. Pretty much, you know, if you see an interesting spot, you just drop a cinematic camera in the scene and just leave it there, mm -hmm. you know, label yeah. it and leave it there. And so often, you know, in a sequencer, uh, 
like say for example hit f11 and come out full screen uh, here at the bottom you would see my sequencer and this is kind of um where a lot of things start to interact with each other inside of unreal um being able to place uh -huh. things on a sequencer timeline and say you know add the animation track add you know the asset you know transform keyframe it so that it's from one spot to another and then you just refine that that line um and a lot of times if you're looking at the like the hud of unreal like the the heads up display for for different elements that you select you can actually see the traveling path of animation it actually highlights it as like a curve in the scene so if i need to you know change the flight pattern of my ship i can just go back and delete a keyframe from its origin you know and then redo the keyframes you know even automatically just just moving it around tilting it yeah. giving it pitch that sort of thing uh, and then you know like the smoke and exhaust or just like particle simple parts that have been altered to, to really give me what i want like a contrail or something like that you know it's yeah. it's really easy to kind of just grab a bunch of different elements and drop them into the scene see how they work before you roll you know now we've had a, a actually several questions flurry in sure. um for just from what you've shown us so far uh sure. so one of them was uh so d for some of these really large more expensive scenes you're showing us here that have like mm -hmm. a high polygon count and everything uh yeah. what would you recommend between unreal or blender when it comes to that um well i see i i use blender um primarily to do a lot of boolean work hard surface work okay um i use a friend of mine's tool uh, um i'm sure a lot many in the blender community are familiar with hard ops and box cutter mm -hmm. uh, just like the logo up here in my hat but uh yeah those guys they've made a great tool so that you know i can do a lot of hard surface modeling very quickly and so blender is like my poly editor mm -hmm. but a lot of times you know even concepting or getting concept meshes going uh, I start from ZBrush, right? And so probably treating both pretty equally, you know, I, I have to do some some things in my pipeline, like either UVing or uh, color IDs, that sort of thing, and where, you know, I'll jump back and forth between Blender and ZBrush quite often, mm -hmm. you know, just, excuse me, just saving OBJs and send, you know, or FBXs and then sending those over uh, to Blender and then adding other things or accessories, you know, just mm -hmm. using, you know, polyols. Um, and then baking them out. And uh, so like, a, I do a lot in between substance and also marmoset tool bag. Yeah. And it's really, it's really just a, a choice of what's going to do it the cleanest, the best bake, you know, um, you know, just going on down the line so that I can have the asset ready to go in Unreal. And sometimes you have to fix things depending on orientation and stuff like that for the axes, but you know, or normals, you know, flipping mm -hmm. flipping normals so that they're correctly displaying, you know, because yeah. sometimes interdependencies between different apps, you know, like there's always a little bit of cleanup and, and whatnot mm -hmm. to handle. But yeah, it's usually pretty smooth, you know. It, it's a fun experience to to be able to sculpt and then you know turn to something else and do a little bit of you know actual box modeling. You know, and then you know, bevel work and whatnot, and then unwrap that. And by the time it gets to be textured, it it lives, the asset lives such a, a different life than when where you started. You know, sure, it's like whittling down a, a bar of soap with a knife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I know, mean, and you, it's you, your own. You've you got your own production pipeline going. It's it right. has it's this whole journey. Um, yeah, it, and I noticed earlier actually we had a, a question come in from. Uh, from one of our viewers regarding, it was more of a question for Noman, but I think we could ask you the question as well as they were sure. wondering, you know, uh, what kind of opportunities does Noman have uh, for classes to high school students for wanting to learn Unreal? And I'll address the first part of the question myself. And um, while, you know, the the full-time programs and the, the individual courses, things like that at Noman are for adult students, um, we have in the past had things like high school summer camp and stuff like that, where you can come and work in Unreal and learn that. Um, obviously, this summer is a bit a bit soon. Uh, the campus won't be open yet. Um, that being said, though, you can always reach out to myself or to admissions. Um, in fact, I don't even mind if my colleague Zach shares my email address in the chat. 
Um, hopefully I don't get a gazillion emails, but, uh, or maybe I do, and that's a cool thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you're out there and you're a high school student and you're like, I, I wanna learn this stuff, um, feel free to ask me some questions and I can even hit up our, uh, our games lead at Noman and say, you know, what would you recommend a high school student go to as a resource for starting to learn Unreal and how to, how to start delving into that. I'd be happy to do that and write you back. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Tony, because I know, you know, you've, how long ago did you first start learning um, Unreal? Exactly almost a year and a half. Um, okay, so that's, that's not very long. Yeah, it's no, it's not very yeah. long at all. And um, the project overall, I've been creating assets for it for about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it started with one character, and then that one character spawned a few more assets that then, you know, continued on to even more. And as as I got hungrier for for props, I just went on a mm -hmm. modeling frenzy for months uh, <laughs> and and put everything into engine. And actually, I had begun to try doing what I'm doing now in Blender in real time. Um, it became more of a question of why I didn't it, you know, eventually go with Blender is because I have so much to certain scenes, you know, doing the world building that there's quite a lot to it. And so it made sense to more so um, do it in Unreal because it can handle such a massive amount of information, right? And, mm -hmm. and assets, if when you think about um, you know, each ship, each vehicle, each, you know, kit bashed of, of building or block, like I've, I've custom made some, some bashable, you know, city blocks and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, and blender. And they're just simple structures really, you know, and I can put textures or displacement on them to, to really bump them out and to, to looking like full scale buildings in a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it takes, it takes a lot of time to, to build, but why is because you know it just simply unreal was able to handle so much at, at the you know i could divide up all of those assets and and keep a pretty good archive of base of things and i can move those assets from project to project pretty seamlessly using migration mm -hmm. and so you know when i build a new level i just steal it from the original project and move it over uh and, and then start setting up new scenery with new levels and it's, it's really nice to be able to have that that flexibility Whereas uh, any other renderer would probably, you know, without proper instancing, like you know, using Cinema 4D or like a full blown motion uh, program, mm -hmm. it would be a lot to handle, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, and I'm wondering I also. Performance and render time out of it. I'm thinking of the the person who asked this question and others that maybe um, mm -hmm. Unreal is entirely new to them. Uh, and they're interested in doing some world building. Maybe they don't even know how to 3D model, and you don't have to. You can use free assets from Quixel. Um, oh, you know, sure. it's a whole ecosystem. If someone yeah. wanted to just start acquainting themselves with Unreal and start to learn how to how to build these worlds with existing 3D models, uh, what? How would you suggest they start into learning that? What would be some good resources? I think the very first thing that I would do, of course, is go check out some of the associated channels with Unreal, um, things like Quixel's, uh, they, Quixel has excellently done a lot of different streams uh, with their mm -hmm. own team. Um, and now, of course, you know, they've been more frequent now that they've joined the team with Epic. Um, and as well, Epic has their Unreal channel on YouTube. Those are invaluable resources, I would say, you know, just being able to go directly to the, you know, the Unreal's maker and, and mm -hmm. learn about it. Um, they also have really good resources on their site, um, like the Unreal Classroom. Um, and I know probably for those that are, you know, more knowledgeable enthusiasts, they might also take up the Unreal Fellowship, uh, which I have actually considered for myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, that. And uh, of course, you know, they have programs like their Maker Grant program, which is awesome. They've given like 500 million over a course of, I think, a year. Uh, to artists wow. to develop their own stuff independently. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the challenge and the resources to learn Unreal are there and they're, they're right at your fingertips, you know, just reach out on, oh, on yeah. YouTube and I'm, I'm sure you can find them. The same yeah. for me years ago is the same for uh, Pixelogic, you know, I think I got in at 4R4 and 4R5 and just, I think of the journey from that point <laughs> until now is like, 
it's like having been alive for a millennia or something, you know, it, um, <laughs> it's been a while, <laughs> you know, because you, yeah. you, you use it and it, it develops and you change with it and you learn new things, new tool sets almost every year now. Um, yes. And that that challenge, uh, I have to say on a personal level, like it's really great because, um, you know, when you think about using your the capacity of your intellect for something, and that the fact that you're constantly learning new things to learn new technologies to make what you want to make uh, is a thrill. It's an absolute, yeah. you know, it's an absolute I, thrill. It's an absolute absolutely. pleasure. <laughs> I can say for sure, like, I mean, even for myself, uh, Blender, getting into Blender was probably two years ago, two to two and a half years ago. Yeah. And then ZBrush yeah. was really, I didn't start getting very serious with ZBrush until about the beginning of 2020. And when you start, at least for me, I remember feeling like there's so much to learn. This is going to take me forever. Um, right. But the funny thing is, like, if you just show up each week or each day or whenever you're doing your learning, just show up and keep taking the very next piece and learning that next piece. It's amazing how quickly you can progress. These are amazing tools. Right. And it's very rewarding. You're right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very rewarding. And it's some good things can come from it. So, you know, say for me, if it wasn't just the films, I think um, one of my big, uh, I guess, goals with starting all of this is to be able to produce concept art with motion, you know, yeah. even if it's using a short loop or just having that ability to, you know, circle a camera around something or, or set up a, a scenario in a scene, even if it's a loop or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, it tells a much richer story than had you just created one static image and presented mm -hmm. that or several different static images, because now you have a whole world that you can um, take shots from. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, it's just awesome. And then you just, like I said, drop a camera, record that, you know, and so you kind of get into the habit of like creating dailies, like a, a director does. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? Uh huh. Right. So like sometimes I'll just, go through the world and start setting up cameras, record things, uh, a few different snippets, uh, and then take that footage and edit it uh, in not only After Effects, but then Premiere. Mm -hmm. uh, so like all of the stuff that you, you saw, like that's where I finally deliver it and, and, and engineer it a bit. Um, you know, sometimes putting in some post effects and stuff like that, that I could easily drop onto the scene and just go with, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, uh, another viewer was wanting to know regarding, uh, let's see, I think there's a couple people to ask regarding some of the sculpts that you've done in ZBrush mm -hmm. and then bringing them in. Are you just sculpting them and exporting them as like FBXs or something like that? Or how are you getting from ZBrush into, uh, into Unreal? So to answer that question, let me go ahead and open my next scene. And, yeah, let's uh, do it. Because that, that actually has some, some closer things that we can actually look at characters a little closer uh, and some assets. So cool. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and uh, oh, got to stop the sequence there. And I just right. got a comment while you're setting that up. It just the sure. few little shots you took us to were so cool. You've got pilots moving around in the cockpit. Uh, yeah. Was, so some sort of a shuttle or something. There was a guy jumping out. And I mean, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. There's a, th that's actually a setup for a different. A uh, bit of uh, footage that I want to take. So mm -hmm. uh, before I close this, here I'll just zoom in, uh, just so that you can see how many, how the variety of the scene uh, in here. There's a lot to it. So there's there's the space bus here, which I've created. Uh, I call it a space bus, uh, kind of stealing some vernacular from 2001. Nice. Okay. <laughs> but uh, there's the space bus carrier here, which is like. Uh, these guys, the Titan troopers here, they, they're sort of a coast guard and they, they jump out like you would a helicopter out of this craft mm -hmm. and, and into multiple environments. And so I wanted to do like a little uh, cockpit shot and have the pilots sitting in their chairs. So uh, first came the ship, then the chair, then the pilot. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a small pilot turning head there and one other pilot, the guy with the yellow helmet there, it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to see. I'll dip in here and see a little closer. That's so cool. But yeah, he's a prop. He's got uh, basically, uh, he's sculpted in ZBrush. 
Uh-huh. Uh and he's painted I think in between Mixer and, and I think I moved those maps over to Substance and then finished them off there with some nice decals and that sort of thing. But what I'll do is I'll sculpt in ZBrush mm -hmm. uh, and then usually getting an, either an A pose or a T pose. Uh, and then a lot of times for expediency, if I'm not rigging them myself or, or attempting to because I'm not the best rigger, but I'll drop them into um, Mixamo and get oh, yeah. know, basic animation mocap data from there. Uh, uh, and the setup in Unreal is different than other renders, but it's an FBX or either an ABC uh, bit of data. Um, there's FBX animations and there's Olympic ABC file extension. Okay. Data. These are just the file formats. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a file format, but they're both similarly key framed and automatically mm -hmm. rigged. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, sometimes if you paint weights or if you're doing some work in Marvelous Designer, you can mm -hmm. use those animations to do the cloth sim and then convert those to Unreal and place both together and parent them. And mm -hmm. then they move and in, in interact seamlessly. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you, if cool. you don't mind, because you, you just said a lot of really cool stuff. Um, if you don't mind the aside really quick, uh, just because I'm, I'm kind of always yeah, thinking sure. of a, maybe that high school student or traditional artist out there that's like blown away by this, but um, maybe is uninitiated into some of these different things. Uh, like Tony right. mentioned Mixamo. Mixamo is totally free. It's cloud-based, it's online. You can take a 3D model of a character, like maybe something you've made in ZBrush, you can upload it, rig it very simply, like just put the skeleton inside of it and then use existing motion captured from real humans animation to animate that model. Um, so it like, right now is one of the best times in history to be an artist because there's so many amazing resources that you can use. And it's just like, it's a, you know, you just keep going down the rabbit hole and discovering more and more things. Um, so if yeah. all this sounds to anybody out there, and I know we've got a lot of hobbyists that you already, you already know these things, but I'm thinking for those viewers that all this sounds new and it's like, this just sounds like too much. Um, if you're fascinated by it, if you're excited, just find some place to begin and start learning a chunk and then learn the next chunk. And it, it's amazing right. like how quickly you can start accumulating the knowledge you need. Yeah. So like something like this kind of breaks the camera plane a little bit, able to zoom in so you could see close yeah. up. So, you know, of course, building these in this way, sometimes they have different tolerances depending on the quality of the model and its bake. And, um, you know, like if I pull the camera back, you know, you can get a fairly amount you know, a really good detail. Uh, and then there are mm -hmm. certain objects that I would only shoot from a medium distance or something like that. Yeah, uh, kind of like your hero props and your background props, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. They're they're broken up and defined that way. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, usually a lot of these I'll go and uh, texture up in substance very quickly by altering a lot of the materials inside or adding, you know, custom maps to um, sometimes even taking maps from mirror and using that okay. as a base to yeah. further do things as, uh, as well, you know, because you can always put your maps on a layer and then layer it up and keep going. And so, you know, I do a little uh, decal stamping and uh, creatively make a bunch of decals. So a yeah. lot of so the Zeus logo, that's the, it actually originated. And then I oh, right stick on. it as a PNG. Yeah. And right there in Substance, you can just stamp it on and well, so you're you, using your you know, things skills like, as a graphic designer and just adding yeah, that to the workflow exactly. right yeah 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 i exactly. thought i saw so, a cyberdyne systems logo back <laughs> there somewhere i thought i saw that the red triangles somewhere in the background but i don't know there's a there's a couple of things like uh i went through and created a whole pack of decals uh nice um just are like fake billboard ads or or you know fake companies like agus is a uh, a local, uh, you know, cybernetic uh, implant maker. You know, you have uh, maybe one of the shipping companies is called uh, Moskova, Moskova Dynamo. <laughs> yeah. You know, just like yeah, I, I feel like this is the world different. that ties together Blade Runner and the whole like Ridley Scott universe. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I am not necessarily doing Blade Runner in that, to, to coin a phrase, I'm actually kind of molesting that world a little bit to some of its space. To be, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, I 
ask myself the question like this, like, um, you watched Blade Runner and you thought to yourself, if I could go to the television and go directly into that screen, what would you see if you turn the corners on? Absolutely. Yep. You know, and, and just like, that's the point at which your, your imagination fills the gap in the presented scenery. And so I wanted to explore that with this. Ooh, mm -hmm. am I cutting it out? Uh, is, no, you're, is my you're, audio cutting out? Your audio was clicking just a little bit, but you're still with us. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, it, there I, is a little yeah, bit of popping going on, though. A little I'm not bit quite of popping. Sure yeah. All right, yeah, probably my, my GPUs are probably going nuts uh, rendering this and streaming <laughs> at the same time. Okay. So bear with me, my apologies. But um, yeah, you, you just you get to building and you just creatively start working in small to large spaces. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, starting with a building and you keep going. Um, and if I was to probably raise the, the camera out of bounds here a little bit, you can kind of just see that most of these are just geographically placed. There's a little bit of card mm -hmm. there to uh, capture the, the or have some, some lights to bounce off of the ground. But uh, yeah, there's an exponential you know, uh, height fog that's been placed in where you get a lot of the smoky, mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, uh, like fog light and stuff like that um and volumetrics uh and then of course the i'm using the sun or the the environment mixer uh, instead of a regular sun mm -hmm. sky so i can get all of my environment in one go and th this is this yeah. is like one of the things that i recently from guys like um, i don't know if you catch him william voucher is an excellent unreal developer and um i think he has some uh, uh, a series of tutorials on YouTube I, I follow, and learn some, you know just some quick stuff like that where you you know you can get excellent lighting out of your environment really fast or how to dial in cameras. Yeah, you know that that community is rising. It's great to see you know, you know if, if people are giving tips on how to do filmic things in, inside of Unreal. So it's it's a really good okay. time to jump in it, learn it, and uh, get it down because you know. You, yeah, you can compose it. It's great. <laughs> no, and obviously, I can I can tell you're having a lot of fun because it shows yeah, in the yeah. work. Um, so I, I I know that I think you have some other uh, videos queued up. I don't know if you want to give your your system a break sure. or let your GPOs take a breath. <laughs> uh, show I'm us some of those. Um, pause to to open up another project, part of this project. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, and while you're doing that, there was a. I just saw a really great question come in in the chat mm -hmm. that I wanted to bring up because I think it's it's a really important question and a very applicable one. Uh, yeah. uh, let's see, it looks like uh, Twitched One Hundred and One. Uh, Tony, could you tell us what skills would be good to practice before we get into this field, other than learning the software? What are some of the other background skills that you think uh, would be important for artists to start learning? Having a great founding art, of course, uh, mm -hmm. art and design. I mean, um, um, I always default back to the one thing that has never left me, and that's the ability to draw and sketch things and visually communicate that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in a field like concept art, you know, for entertainment, whether it be for games or film or doing some storyboarding, um, being able to compose, right, uh, composition and, and also, you know, uh, knowing some fundamentals like, uh, you know, depth, mass, volume, mm -hmm. lighting, <laughs> all of those things yeah. uh, always come into play uh, as a foundation. Uh, so, you know, if you have your foundation artistic, you know, abilities, you know, well practiced and you keep them up no matter what. Like I had an art teacher years ago uh, when I was going to high school in Denver, uh, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson used to say to me, he was a college level instructor who taught mm -hmm. high school and he'd said never leave your house without your sketchbook Just demanding like you know and I, yep. I i took that to heart as a 15 year old 16 year old and i now have the habit where i am an, an incessant like buyer of sketchbooks you know, like <laughs> I, I just buy them all the time. And I, yep. even, even if I don't finish them, but to have it, the tool there for the readability of ideas to be laid out, to, yes. to keep your hand in motion and keep going. Uh, so, you know, me coming from comics, you know, that was a huge part of, of me as a creator. 
And yeah. then I, I always fall back or default back to some of those skills as, you know, in place as I, I keep going and, and doing yeah. things that are digital, whether it be digital drawing and painting, um, you know, doing idealization sketches where I'm just using gray values to color um, and then paint overs, or if I'm using photographic elements in the, you know, the same rules still apply with your outfit, you know, your art education foundation. So it's very yeah. important. Yeah, and, yeah, which, and it's, to which I might say, uh -huh. really love the fact that places like Noman exist, uh, you know, and the placement of our community exactly for that, because it, and it's and it's quite democratic in the way that it's not only for younger people but for older people who want to absolutely you know, sharpen mm -hmm. those those skills, sharpen that that blade, you know. Totally, yeah, and it yeah. is it is a samurai sword. Like you, you it exactly. it doesn't just get built and then you don't pay attention to it. You've got to maintain it. You've got to sharpen it. Yes. Um, yeah, and 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 thank you for saying so uh, about Noman. Um, I I know our founder yes. Alex Alvarez is always talking about. You know, people will ask him. You know, what software should I learn? What's the new technical thing that's going to make yeah. something awesome? And he always just says, "Draw. Just keep drawing. Yeah. Don't stop drawing because." That's the that's the fundamental form of storytelling for artists. Um, true, but I, I think true. you mentioned sketchbooks, and I need to I, I need to uh, maybe rabbit trail just a teeny bit on that because I do get to spend time with a lot of younger artists, and a sketchbook can be a very intimidating thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think particularly because we live in an age of social media, and yeah. the temptation can be for an artist to treat their sketchbook like an Instagram feed, right? Like uh, every page yeah. has got to be amazing. Whereas right, right. that's not what I'm hearing you say. You're talking about yeah. having something that's always with you, so you can get all your ideas out, and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter whether every one of them is perfect. You know, it's funny. A few years back, I actually grew tired of drawing extraneously, like mm -hmm. like like overdrawing things, and I went through a process of trying to oversimplify myself or mm -hmm. draw rougher, which was a good practice because then. You know, I knew how to be tight. And it reminds me of like, you know, when you go to art school, they tell you, you know, about using your arm versus using your wrist. And everybody, yeah. you know, might, you know, the proper way of holding a, a drawing device, you know, and being able to control your wrist and your elbow and the rest of your arm to do larger, you know, more contoured forms and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. it, those, those kinds of points always surface to the top of my mind when I think about drawing. You know, to to not do that, to basically be flexible enough and, and give yourself an artistic challenge. Mm, so, yeah. you know, it's just it's just it's just a, a daily grind. You know, like I, I yeah. spent before this like three years just sketching heavily over like a span of three years uh, for the sake of maybe doing an art book. And now I have yeah. a stack of drawings that I I pull out every once in a while that's like two inches thick. You know, yeah. and some of them are not perfect. Some of them are just, you know, half done or half baked or, mm -hmm. you know, little smaller thoughts that may be taken into doing something larger later, you know, but uh, it's like a, your own personal design Bible. Sense. Totally. And I think I, I forget which writer it was, unfortunately, I wish I could remember, but there was a, a writer and they were using the term compost heap, like every creative needs a compost yeah. heap of just a pile of ideas because you never stop you know, working on your ideas. And right. I think you know, sketching or drawing or just doing your art every day is is kind of, it's exercise. Like, I think, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I think, you know, if you, if you go for a jog every day or at certain intervals in the week, it's not like you approach every one of those, like this is gonna be the best jog ever. You know, it's just like, I'm doing right. it because it's something that I need to maintain. It's something that I need to sh keep showing up to and showing yeah, up is the win. It's it's like um, keeping your own visual shorthand, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the faster you can do that for yourself, the faster you're able to work out ideas. And it's not so much it, it becomes a point to where it's not so much um, the idea of the thing, but it's more so or not so much the execution of the thing, but it's more mm -hmm. of the idea of the thing. Whereas you need to get an idea out quickly and you need to depend on a skill to do that. So to visualize that first. You're going to use your hand and that hand is well trained to some muscle memory degree like yes. uh, uh our good friend scott robertson might say mm -hmm. you know and that muscle memory evolves right it gets sharper it gets you know at times it can be looser so when you need something expedient you know because you have 
a production person or a director or an art director who wants something, you know, you can then rough it out and say, yeah, but change this. And so the yeah. tangibility is there where, you know, some drawings may be expendable and some may be of good quality for what you want in your final product, you know, it's, yes. uh, but it's at least your, it's of your choosing and your, your time. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Yeah. Oh, these guys look cool. So I just opened this up. This uh -huh. is actually Ganymede Furumachi, which is like, uh, Furumachi means like old street in Japanese. All right. And, uh, I made this as basically one of the main scenes to the whole Ganymede project that I'm doing. So imagine, if you will, uh, the story, the sort of pseudo narrative of the story is that Ganymede has been slightly terraformed and mm -hmm. there's a massive mega city on it that uh, has an environment inside its realm, right? Because Ganymede, as I hear, may have aquifers underneath its crust that have a, a water source and scientifically, I hear that it has a magnetosphere, so which is what you need to actually keep an atmosphere intact. Mm -hmm. So I, I, with that idea, I built this place. And uh, this is just sort of like a, a slice of life uh, sort of uh, composition here. And so there are like lots of little scenes where, you know, you have the, the guys walking to the, the dock of the ship. And you have like a huge gunship mounted it. You know, parked yeah, up next to a building so here. Cool. Yeah. Um, then some of this more familiar, you know, architecture that I used in the other level is here. You know, the Zagat, uh, which is actually probably going to get redone. I think it could be a lot more detailed. So I'm going to try to work on another one. We have a space truck here. It's like a, a small shuttle craft that's kind of common enough to maybe park in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Like a loader. And then um, most of these billboards are white now, but I have to turn on the media to individually play them. So okay. I'll play as any where they're actually lit. Sure. But uh, if we go down to the street level here, that's where things start to get a little bit more interesting. So this level was built mostly using stuff that I've done in either, uh, you know, ZBrush and Blender heavily. Uh, some of the buildings are also kit bashed, you know, using things mm -hmm. like, or resources like uh, kit bash 3D, but I never use them directly. I usually alter them heavily, sure. you know? And so uh, there again is where Substance and also Mixer helped me with that. Yay for Mixer now that it has texture sets because then I can yeah. you know, <laughs> break things up a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, really happy for those guys for the new That's update. Great. But uh, yeah, in a lot of these, I can take uh, you know screenshots of, of course. And as you're composing in, in Unreal, if you just hit the F9 button, you know, with cinematic view, it'll mm -hmm. actually capture uh, you know an actual uh, still frame of it, and you can open it up and view it, you know, run it into Photoshop and do some mm -hmm. other effects and that sort of thing. So that's really handy. It's, uh, almost like just a, a generative machine of scenery. Yeah. Well, you're <laughs> yeah. kind of, you're, you're walking around your own imagination and taking snapshots, you know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So there, there are things like um, nice props like these. Uh, I created the data comm booth there, the phone booth where the girl is mm -hmm. standing. And so I would use elements that I would make like that. Uh, maybe use a few ideal idealization characters that I also alter a bit. Um, but also like, you know, things like this, where this, the design of these, uh, like vending machines here, this is actually a prop by, uh, Jan Urschel. And oh, I nice. Asked him if, if I could modify his vending machine a bit to fit in unreal. And so, yeah, we, a friend and I spent some time like kind of plucking them apart and and you know got them real you know into unreal uh but yeah some of the first you know props from this whole level were things like this like the, the pillars that you recognize from blade runner or something mm -hmm. is getting proper reference and building you know something akin to it if not an exact uh, duplicate and just you know using those as the the base for layout you know uh, street floors and things like that from mixer yeah. you know plates with a, a tile that have a, a wet layer for the sort of filming, you know, rain or wet look on the ground. 
uh, so that there's a lot more specularity to kind of look wet, you know, adding in layers and stuff like that to the textures. And, and these these really burly, color. these burly looking dudes yeah. in the scene there, are those, did you make those in ZBrush, the sculpts of yours or? I did. Um, in fact, here, let me just turn up the texture stream a little bit. And you're you're having way too much fun, Tony. Look at all the stuff that you're making. Hey, yeah, it's really I cool. Am. I am. Um, and the the idea is, the end goal is is kind of changed. So, as of recent, I'm sure a lot of young people are familiar with, um, you know, what's been going on in the NFT community. And mm -hmm. um, I'm actually trying to use uh, NFTs to deliver media this way. Um, okay. Basically, doing short films in Unreal and then releasing them as NFTs, but also, you know, to my YouTube channel to share with everyone so that everyone is able to see it. But really and literally using that platform to fund it so that I can turn it into a larger uh, production of quality. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, say if it ever happens, I, I might hire a few friends to, to come in and, you know, help me build it. You know, so that it, yeah. it becomes more finite as a vision. But uh, yeah, these guys yeah, were. It's, it's kind of part of that whole computer. ecosystem of, you know, people that might kickstart a sketchbook that they want to release. Right. So that, that, that can become the patrons that they need to do the next project and so forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah these guys are cool. Up and I'm getting, I don't know, I it's just me, but I'm getting a little bit of almost like an Alita Battle Angel kind of vibe too, like these guys. Yeah, be, there's, you know, the hunters. I, 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 you know, stuff like that also influences me. I, I actually read um, Battle Angel Elite uh, uh, as a comic in Japan. You know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I think the there's a story that's after his main event of, of Battle Angel Alito called Gunnam. It's, mm. it's spelled strangely, but it's G-U-N. It, it, in Jap Japanese, they pronounce it Gunma, I believe. But it's like the tale of uh, Gully much after that story in, you know, in deep space. And, you know, okay. Uh, it, you know, she has like fight tournaments or something like that. But a lot of the characters are just so extremely over the top that I love them. <laughs> you know, yeah. It speaks to a, a time in science fiction where, you know, like in the seventies and eighties where, you know, things were huge and bold, but they didn't quite have the technology that we have today. And so to, to sort of take layers from that and add, you know, a look of today, you know, yeah. branding, it's always pretty cool. And so, you know, when the film came about, I was really excited for it. It was done really well. But yeah, something in that vein, you know, there, there are guys in here that are cyborgs, you know, with with human, human, human uh, upgraded humans, you know, I guess I would say, sure. and, and gangsters. And, uh, you know, there's the soldier guys and stuff like that. There's, well, uh, and well done, because I'm totally yeah. getting that feeling you were talking about <laughs> earlier. As you're just as you walking us around here, I'm like, but ooh, what's that over behind that corner? And wh what's going on inside right. there? And what are they selling that shop? You know, and it's, yeah, just, it's really there's, cool, man. Yeah, so just staging like a common areas to a city floor. So the, yeah. the entire scene is basically like a T section, if you will imagine. And uh, with one main block, and then some things off to the side of it. And then on the T part of it, uh, there are other streets, like little side streets where there mm -hmm. are things going on or just like you know, basic space to set up another scene. So that if I move the camera down the street, depending on the angle, I might be able to make it or dress it to look like a, an entirely different area of the city. Yep, just just right. like they do in television and film, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like, um, for example, you know, I, my wife, she worked for Warner and I got mm -hmm. to tour the Warner lot and walk down the same streets where they filmed Blade Runner. If you if you know nice. the New York set there and uh, when you when you look at it, you see the sort of practicality of how shots might have been derived, you know, just given the changes in cosmetics around yeah. the scenery. Right. Then you could literally, depending on the ang angle, just make it look like a different place. Yeah. So. Just um, working I, with ideas like that, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I could, 
I'm, I could keep nerding out forever. Um, I do want to be respectful of your, respectful of your time. I know we're at about, right about an sure, hour sure. right now. Uh, we can go oh, over yeah. a little if you need to. Um, okay, but did you have some, some additional things you wanted to show us, some additional animations? I want to make sure I'm not uh, stalling about, you on anything. That's that's about it for a preview. I'll, I'll actually, you know what, I'll play, uh, let's find one more clip. Because I think cool. when you see it in perspective now that you had a little tour down the street, Yeah. Uh, let me show you this one. And these streets are beautiful. I mean, you've it's, I can, you. there's been a lot of love put into these streets. I can I can tell. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting there. There's still a, a few minor changes I want to do as I as I film. Maybe take and redact a few things, or you know, keep going with it. But yeah, the basic set project is is kind of like that, and it, and it mm -hmm. gets worked on all the time. Uh, it's kind of funny because right now, here if I just pull the camera back. There we go. Let's go back over here. Up the street here, you see this white car in the middle of the street here? Mm -hmm. That is actually an actor. Uh, and this is where I was trying out some of the t stuff that we were talking about using green screening. And so oh, yeah. I'll, cool. I'll be able to populate scenes a lot more. I'm not going to jump in and play it now, but there's an act actor, character actor that goes inside that car that you know was rendered elsewhere and then brought into the real-time environment. So, That's great. You, know, you can you can do some very VFX ended tricks in Unreal, you know, cards, green screening, composure on the sequencer. Uh, you know, it, it's really, really cool. Uh, like, I'm not even done studying <laughs> a lot of this to make it work. But uh, here, let's find this. And while you're setting that up, um, sure. uh, we have had a couple of questions, um, you know, about sure. hardware. And uh, one in particular, uh, let's see, uh, from uh, someone who's a virtual production research student. Uh, they're trying mm -hmm. to build a world in Unreal Engine, uh, but they're a bit okay. nervous about uh, processor constraints. And they're just curious to know what your advice is to those who may not be able to afford, uh, afford the high-end devices in right. the beginning, right at the onset. So I, I think I saw one of the questions earlier. Someone was asking me if I'm using ray tracing. Mm -hmm. um, I am decidedly not going to, uh, mostly because of the fact that it's a bit expensive, but um, you can usually get by getting a, the look that you want using like a dynamic lighting. And so you have to enable some of the ray tracing features in the project settings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, like you've seen me, I've, I've got ray tracing disabled, but here in the top corner, you can always change the screen percentage a little bit. And it just helps for the presentation value. Like if you're, you know, wanting a, a crisper look inside of you okay. know, Unreal's viewport. Mm -hmm. um, but usually I dial it back to 100 when I render uh, because it's it's quite heavy. And then the frames that I render out at, I'm doing like um, EXRs that are full 16 bit in a lot of cases, or just like the raw footage that I go to um, Apple Pro encoder uh, and use that as the master. Uh, clip for editing, right? And so when I get the frames out as EXRs, I have to take them and encode them in Adobe Encoder. Uh, and But the, the good thing about it is I have control over the color of, of things uh, using EXRs. If you're worried about running hardware, there are a lot of people who use the dynamic lighting who don't have you know serious RTX cards or anything beyond like say a 1080, uh, and they still run it well. You know, okay. um, I myself, as far as my own setup, I have a AMD Ryzen 9, uh, it was at the 3900X uh, and about 68 gigs of RAM or 64 gigs of RAM, uh, two 2080 supers with, that are in V-Link. And so I got two of those cards because they were pretty much of a, a bargain considering like the price of a 2080, I think at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it just made sense and it, it works well for things like, again, like Unreal, Octane, any type of rendering if you're doing like a Redshift or anything like that. Okay. So, but for Unreal, it, it works quite, I mean, that's more than enough. But I, I think if you had one decent, you know, grade card, like a 28 or above, uh, now even into the RTX 30 series, you should be probably good. But cool. if you don't, 980s, 1080s, they can still run Unreal pretty decently. I just mm -hmm. probably wouldn't do as much uh, ray tracing there. Or uh, uh, 
would it yeah. help? I mean, maybe not do as large of a scene to start with. Work, work exactly. In chunks exactly. And stuff like that. Working, yeah. working also smaller or um, also map efficiency. It just the budgetary concerns that you might have mm -hmm. for certain geometries or, or their yeah. UV maps, uh, texture quality. So everything here is pretty much baked out at 4K. Um, and, you know, 4096 maps. Uh, every once in a while, there's maybe, you know, uh, you know, 2K maps, but mostly I try to keep a consistency of maps throughout the project so that I know everything will display, you know, pretty much the same. And I'm using uh, Unreal packed channel maps, which basically kind of reduce the number of maps uh, so that you can, you know, plug only the RGB values of those maps into one. I think roughness, occlusion, and uh, metallic are actually combined into one map. Okay, so just a lot of efficiency and how everything's yeah. packed together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So with those measures, yeah, you can you can get by even on, you know, um, a, a car that doesn't have particularly a high spec. Cool. Yeah, okay. and I, I just think it's amazing, you know, that Unreal, Quixel, all that stuff has just been made available for free, you know? Yeah. For, it totally. doesn't matter who you are. I mean, I, and you, and I think you, it's, as long as you're not making more than a certain tier of, of cash using their product, like they just want creators to make, make stuff, go make stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and having like a complete package around it, I think is, Heck is yeah. always good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people doing some really great stuff. Um, you know, in unreal, I see posted all the time online, um, in places like art station or, um, even I think, a Justin Gobi feels he has his 10K thread uh, online, and that's an excellent, you know, venue of artists that are, you know, doing all sorts of things, not just you know 3D modeling, but you know a little bit of Unreal stuff, mm -hmm. illustration stuff, uh, you know, using multiple softwares and disciplines to to create really beautiful imagery. Uh, um, well, I mean, and and before before we let you go, I always sure. like to uh, I like to ask our guests questions. I think regarding what advice they would share to um, beginners, to maybe artists who are out there in high school or mm -hmm. you're in your first couple of years of community college and they're coming over from maybe traditional art skills, 2D art skills, a lot of things that you were doing like graphic design, right. uh, comics and so forth. They're looking yeah. you know, through the window at the world of 3D, but some of the common reservations are, well, you know, it's going to be so technical it doesn't feel creative anymore. Or where do I start learning? Like how how will my artistic things that I'm excited about doing right now how will they apply to working right. on 3D? Yeah, and what would you say about that? Because I think you you're you're perfect person to ask um, about that journey. I think that um, you know never let yourself get bored. Mm. Um, you know, and it, and it's quite it's quite easy you know to to get bored in some instances but if you if you have a hunger uh, and and if you just put like an ethic to where you stay with something even if you're doing something else in life mm -hmm. you know if you have a little bit of time to carve out like a lot of this is just you know late nights you know where i wanted to build this thing and i just it kept going and snowballing into this larger thing uh and then you know i would get lost in making buildings for a week or <laughs> working on a shuttle for like uh two weeks you know and it's in between that and regular life it just kept growing at a pace because you you know being able to um set a goal and decide that you're gonna finish that goal and not be disinterested in it you know or even if you have disinterested moments take a break from it and come back to it but yet keep the pursuit of what you wanted to do so in other words don't let go of your dream stay mm. diligent and, you know, hard pressed, you know, to the drawing board or, you know, to your machine and take the time to do things. Cause I think the reward is in looking at a finished product and especially, you know, I build things in unreal, but when I push them, you know, into making these clips, the satisfaction at the end is so rewarding, you know, that, yeah. um, and I think back on all of the skills and all of the things that it took to get to that point. And then I think again as to where I really want to be with it. And so I just continue that creativity. So, you know, and, and there are moments when I, I get artist blogs and I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll fuddle for a moment and I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. what to do, what to do. But, you know, I take time to go back and look at original things that I was inspired by. Like, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm not a young guy, 
you know, but, you know, I think back on what inspired me, you know, growing up or mm -hmm. that moment that, you know, uh, Ripley, you know, went heart ham on the alien queen, you know, <laughs> back in 1986, yeah. back in 1986, I was looking at the theater going, man, this is the most awesome thing in the world, you know, mm -hmm. or 2001, or, you know, I think of those, those influences, all the time and, and you know sometimes i'll take a break and just go watch some movies and be mm -hmm. re-inspired by those things yeah. so you know just um a lot of time management and and due diligence to you know making something come alive you know and, and being able to speak in your own voice you know finding your own yeah. voice and all of this is, is especially the most uh uh, one of the biggest considerations in doing anything. <laughs> yeah, and I'm also, I think between the lines too, I think I'm hearing a little bit of like, just be gracious with yourself too. Like yes, keep showing yes. up and be gracious with yourself. Like don't don't yeah. feel like you have to get it perfectly the first time. Setting setting small goals to make larger goals as well. That's right, um, absolutely. You know, don't bite off more than you can chew and, and let it, allow it to have a gradual buildup. Nothing is instantaneous or has instantaneous gratification. You know, you just, you, you, you work at it. You work, you really yeah. do. Well, and what you've done and on course, Ganymede education is, is good for that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and it's, it's all, it's all part of that equation. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you, you had your education and then you built with that and you've right. done diverse things with, with your training and then you found your way into what you're doing now. But yeah. um, I, I can't imagine a more perfect example of everything you just said than kind of going around Ganymede and looking at, because this isn't just one project. This is like hundreds and hundreds of projects that have like coalesced oh, yeah. I'll, into I'll a be world. Building for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like you remind of me of the common, yeah, yeah. things. You're like done, the guy but... painting his D and D miniatures in the basement. Like you know, I just need to paint one more, and then I'll have the yeah, yeah. the castle will be ready. You know, <laughs> these um, are my mixtapes. You know? Exactly, exactly. So. No, it's super awesome. Um, well. Again, I mean, uh, seriously, I could sit here and nerd out all day, but thank you so much uh, thank you. for your time. It has been wonderful to not only see your work, but to get to know you and to hear it directly sure. from you. I think, um, I know that there are more animations and more short clips to be seen. If people want to follow you on social media and kind of see as you're as you're oh, dropping yes. kind of the latest progress you've made, what, where, where do they need to go to do that? Uh, you can find me on Instagram uh, mm -hmm. as Tony Coro. Uh, and, you know, I'm in and around a few of the NFT spaces, of course, uh, you know, guys like uh, F&D and Foundation. Mm -hmm. I got an invite there. They've been wonderful. Uh, and, you know, just learning this new territory in the art market as mm -hmm. well. On top of that is, you know, mind blowing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can also catch me on Twitter uh, as Tony Coro Studios. And I'm there. And I, I do a lot of... Um, shots uh, on my instagram where i show you know midway points to my work or like progressions to my work like i'll show you the mesh i'll show you you know what's been going on in the next phase and then mm -hmm. all the way to the final and so i do a lot of that and a lot of people like to that engagement to come and, and get involved so if you ever want to come and see me be creative look me up on instagram and twitter oh yeah and i i would also highly recommend people rating your uh youtube channel and also looking for you on uh, Pixel Logics uh, yeah. streams. Uh, you've done some fantastic, yeah. fantastic streams there. I've learned a lot from you uh, watching some of the really cool stuff you've done. I think in ZBrush and Blender, taking 3D and rendering that in a, like a 2D manga kind of a look. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Awesome I'm stuff. using some of those. Uh, yeah, in fact, um, I think it was great when the guys over at Pixel Logic they started having the render sets that you could kind yeah. of customize different render looks. You know, especially in the more illustrative way and mm -hmm. you know that's something i could geek out on but yeah it's it's pretty dope, <laughs> it's pretty dope. Yeah. but um you know i want to thank those guys uh you know um joe and you know everybody over there has been really cool jamie you know uh of course mr gabry you know can't forget him you know huge thanks i've i've got some other guys you know like that i work with um on the sides and different like little communities and stuff like that like my guys with box cutter I, you know, I thank them, They're, you know, because they, those are the guys who are like mentors that, you know, push me, you know, we're all, you know, pushing each other, you know, sometimes additionally, finding other artists that you can vibe with, you know, that you could creatively pick up and like a cell, you know, almost mm -hmm. like a factionizing your art a little bit yeah. is, is also cool because, you know, yeah, you can get gain, gain some, some really good allies and those people can vibe with you and yeah. give you inspiration to carry on 
to your goal. <laughs> but it's it's an awesome community out there. It really is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Tony. Thank um, you. Hey, be Cheers. well. Um, I look forward to opportunities we might have to meet in person. If you ever want to come out and check out the Nome I, campus, I, you know, I, I will I'm give you a tour forward. personally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that we can slowly get things back to normal and, you know, protocols aside, you know, yeah. I really look forward to events over at Nomont sometimes to show up and, you know, have a chat with everybody. Definitely. And guys, please uh, share your love and thanks for Tony in the chat uh, for him taking the time to, to show us around uh, his off-world colony. And um, I just want to say, guys, uh, to remind you that, you know, if you those of you have been asking questions about Nomen's educational offerings in the chat who are curious, um, we, we're going to be open and on campus again in the fall. Um, we have plenty of online offerings. And if you want to take an individual class online or something to that extent, it's still going to be available to you. But um, if you are looking to uh, be on the Nomen campus, we'll be opening up in the fall uh, for that term. So we'd love to see you there. Uh, but in the meantime, everybody, stay safe. Stay creative, and uh, we'll see you back here on the stream. I believe the next one will be Wednesday, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Our chief creative officer, Josh Herman, is uh, has been doing some really cool sculpts and projects in ZBrush, and uh, just taking time to hang out with people, answer questions, do little micro demonstrations and stuff. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Ha happy Friday, and have a good weekend. And thank you again, thank you. Tony.